Well, greetings everyone. My name is Will Wakeling. I'm the Dean of Libraries here at Northeastern. And I want to welcome you all for what's a very special occasion for us. Uh, this year we're celebrating 20 years of Snell Library and we're trying to do it in as grand and imposing a way as we can in many different forms and facets. So today is just entirely typical of what we have in mind, a double header that includes a prize winning author and, uh, and a wonderful occasion as we open for the first time, declare open our new alumni reading room. So this is a, this is a great occasion and we'll have a, a couple of uh, uh, speeches in a, a, after I've finished that will uh, accomplish some of the thanks that are due to the people who have brought about the, uh, the wonderful uh, uh, reading room that we'll be opening today. And here's an interesting thing. Of course, the, uh, the reading room speaks very eloquently to the classic role of the library as a beautiful physical space where people can study and reflect and so forth. Uh, in contrast to that, today we're also announcing a new program that we're just launching um, of uh, donor recognition using digital electronic book plates. So you fund or give a book to the library and we tag it with an electronic book plate so that whenever anybody finds or looks for that book in the catalog, you'll see uh, recognition of the gift itself. So this is an interesting juxtaposition of the physical library and the new digital environment that we're trying to make the best of for everybody's advantage. Okay, now before I go any further, let me say a few words of thank you. The first, as we do with all these Meet the Author series events, is to thank the library's Programming and Communications Committee for putting together all the details, thanks to them. But I also have to, today, thank a number of co-sponsors. We're really pleased to have the collaboration of the Office of Alumni Relations, uh, the Disability Resource Center, the Humanities Center, and of course, NU Bookstore, as ever, supporting us with these, uh, with these events. And the bookstore will be providing copies, signed, I hope, by the author, for you to purchase after, after we've uh, concluded the, uh, the uh, introductions and, and uh, details of the session. Okay, now if you don't already know about it, let me just quickly mention the Meet the Author series. This is a, a, a library institution now that has a very specific mission. Uh, that is to encourage dialogue on significant contemporary questions and to bring together faculty, students, and staff to debate and discuss those issues. And I think you'll agree today is going to be a fine uh, example of that and a good opportunity for question and answer will be available. And, and a quick reminder that you can support the Meet the Author series by becoming a library supporter. And uh, there are plenty of volunteers here who help you sign up to become one of those. We're also filming today's event, so you'll be able to see it on Northeastern's YouTube and iTunes uh, University channels. We also appreciate your feedback, so if you've got a chance to fill in one of the feedback cards that we're leaving for you, please do that and return those to a library volunteer. Thanks. Now, I'd like to inv invite Jack Moynihan, uh, Northeastern's Vice President for Alumni Relations, to say a few words about the Alumni Reading Room and our good friends Corinne and Jean Rapucci are here today. Thank you very much. morning if I should sit down and uh, jot down a few notes and uh, I didn't really need to because what I really want to do is come over here today and speak to heart about two great friends, Gene and Gren Rapucci. As Will mentioned earlier, we're about to open uh, yet another resource for our wonderful alumni community, 204,000 strong, and give them another resource to come over not only here to the wonderful library, but to come over here and to engage with other alums. And hence, today, we will open the alumni reading room. But it's so much more than that, it's so much more to that than that, because what it is, is a true symbol of what we want our alums to do. <coughs> many of you, I'm sure, know Gene, who for many, many years led the charge here at Northeastern for university advancement and uh, brought us to uh, great heights. And he is one of those alums, along with Karen, another alum, that has never forgotten Northeastern. Just the other night, I walked into Matthews Arena, and the place was on fire. 
playing Boston College, plays with Brock, and I want to be up in the doghouse. And I look down the row, and here they are, watching the game. They are ingrained, ladies and gentlemen, in every facet of this university. You always see them around campus. You always see them at our events. And what they've been able to do through their generosity today is, yet again, be a shining example of what we want in all of our Huskies. So on behalf of our Senior Vice President, Diana McGilvery, and our President, Joseph Amor, I want to sincerely pass along our deepest thanks for what we are very proud to call now our alumni meeting room. And as you can all imagine, ladies and gentlemen, this doesn't happen without the help and assistance of a lot of folks, a lot of people. So I do just want to acknowledge our facilities department. They did a wonderful job. Maria Carpenter, my colleague in the libraries that uh, worked very, very hard on this. But I want you to think about one thing. Because as I sit here and I think about what the alumni reading room now means for us, it is a really neat bookend to our alumni center, which I hope many of you have visited over the last few years. The key to this is Huskies helping Huskies. That's what I preach wherever I go, and that's what I want all of you to take from this. So on behalf of all, this being Karen, Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite Dean up for a few words. They said the light has to be green, so I'm assuming it's green and you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, Jack. I appreciate those kind words. Um, I'm going to be brief because I'm looking forward, as I know you are, to listening to uh, our, our Pulitzer Prize author, talk with us. But I wanted to take just a few minutes to try to explain to you why the dedication of this room honoring the memory of my parents is so very important to me and to my wife, Kareem. I'm going to give you three or four reasons. There are many, but I'll give you three or four. First of all, the room is in the Snell Library. Now, a few of you were with me in the 80s when we raised money for the Snell Library. And you know that we poured our hearts and souls into the campaign because we believed that the library would be, and we know it is, the heart and soul of Northeastern University. George and his wonderful wife, Lorraine, helped make the facility possible by giving generously to designate the facility in their name. I knew George from the early 1960s, and I developed a very special relationship with him that extended through his life and is extended now to his wife, Lorraine, with whom I stay in touch. The day this library was dedicated, November 1st, 1990, was a joyous occasion. I was to meet George and Lorraine at the airport, be their host for the day, and help escort George as he received an honorary degree. Sadly, the day before, October 31, my mother passed away, so I was unable to be at the dedication. And I will tell you that every time I pass this campus, I'm in the quad, I'm in this facility, I'm at the university. I have very, very strong memories of my mother and of George Snell. A second re reason is that it's an alumni reading room. Now, while I was here for 34 years toiling in the vineyards, I met thousands of alumni, and I'm still meeting alumni as a retiree who give generously back to the university because they believe Northeastern helped them achieve a better life. I dealt closely with the Alumni Association, with its presidents, and I was humbled and honored when I retired to learn that the Alumni Association gave the university a generous gift to endow a scholarship in my name, which today is awarded to deserving sons and daughters of Northeastern alumni. 
A third reason is that it is a reading room. My mother loved books. She loved libraries. She traveled almost every day to the North End branch of the Boston Public Library. It's located on Parmenter Street in the North End, about three blocks from where she was born and raised, and about four blocks from where my father was born and raised. If you visit that library today, and if you meet the chief librarian, and if you mention my mother, Anna, she will smile, and she will tell you that she was a loyal patron, a wonderful volunteer, a member of the book club, and is still recalled with fondness at the North End branch of the Boston Public Library. And I guess lastly, I'll tell you just a little brief story. When my mother died, uh, I took my father into Northeastern, and we walked around to a few of the facilities that I thought could possibly be appropriate to memorialize my mother. We came into what is now the alumni reading room. My father turned to me and said, I like it. And I turned to him and said, I like it too. So over the years, I worked with Jack Monahan and with Maria Carpenter and with Will Wakeling to help make I like it a reality. So I thank them for their help in ensuring this very significant day. Uh, I'll end by saying that uh, I know my mother and father uh, looking down with uh, very full hearts. My father was sort of a quiet, uh, good philanthropist. He, he never wanted any recognition for any of his good deeds. So he's probably looking down and shaking his head a bit, wondering why did I add his name to my mother's name on the room. Meanwhile, my mother is looking down with a beaming smile, very loving, but she's also wondering. And with all due respect to our uh, distinguished author, she's wondering why the delay in her son not receiving a Pulitzer, <laughs> or perhaps a MacArthur, or a Nobel, or e even a Heisman Trophy. It wouldn't matter to her. So I, I wanted to express to you from my heart, as Jack has done from his heart, uh, how meaningful this day is to me and to my wife, and how proud I am to be here representing them. All hail Northeastern. Thank you, Jean, Corinne. We thank you and we salute you. Now, let me introduce our distinguished author today, Paul Harding. He grew up on the North Shore and has a BA in English from UMass Amherst and an MFA from the Distinguished Writers Workshop um, at, in Iowa. He's taught writing both at Harvard and at the University of Iowa. He also has half a dozen years as the drummer in a rock band under his belt. We'll perhaps hear in the next few minutes what the significance of that might have been for his writing and for his hearing. Um, it may not have escaped your notice that Paul's debut novel, Tinker's, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2010 for fiction. Let me quote the citation of the uh, award jury. The citation speaks of Tinker's as, quote, a powerful celebration of life in which a New England father and son, through suffering and joy, transcend their imprisoning lives and offer new ways of perceiving the world and mortality. Now, many of you, I'm sure, have already immersed yourself in, that extra in the extraordinary world that, uh, that Paul creates for us in Tinkers. What may not have registered with you is that this is the first independently published Pulitzer Prize winner in almost three decades. The Bellevue Literary Press is a tiny, tiny press, part of the New York University School of Medicine. 
there's a story behind that, and maybe Paul will tell us some more about it. There's a great article also I saw in the Wall Street Journal, which tells how the editorial director of the press, Erica Goldman, received a call from an Associated Press journalist just before the winner's announcement. The journalist told her that Tinkers had won. And according to the article, quote, a few minutes after that, Goldman was speaking on the phone with the book's author, Paul Harding. Quote, we were both screaming at the top of our lungs, trying not to fall out of our chairs and bang our heads on the radiator. And why not? Now that we've carefully removed all the radiators from the vicinity, let me introduce Paul Harding. I think this is, yes. Thank you. It's a, it's a um, great pleasure and a great honor to be here to um, help celebrate the uh, inauguration of the uh, alumni reading room. And um, what I think I will do is read um, for maybe 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes from the book to give you a flavor of what's in it. Um, and uh, then I'll be glad to um, answer questions or help, you know, talk, talk to you about the, some of the interesting parts of um, winning the Pulitzer Prize and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think that this, this uh, what, the excerpt that I'm going to read is, is self-explanatory. Um, the only thing you need to know is, is that this is taking place in northern Maine in uh, about 1927. Howard Aaron Crosby drove a wagon for his living. It was a wooden wagon. It was a chest of drawers mounted on two wooden axles and two, uh, excuse me, it was a chest of drawers mounted on two axles and wooden spoked wheels. There were dozens of drawers, each fitted with a recessed brass ring pulled open with a hooked forefinger that contained brushes and wood oil, tooth powder and woolen stockings, shaving soap and straight edge razors. There were drawers with shoe shine and boot strings, broom handles and mop heads. There was a secret drawer where he kept four bottles of whiskey. Mostly back roads were his route, dirt tracks that ran into the deep woods to hidden clearings where a log cabin sat among sawdust and tree stumps and a woman in a plain dress and hair pulled back so tight that she looked as if she were smiling, which she was not, stood in a crooked doorway with a cocked squirrel gun. Oh, it's you, Howard. Well, I guess I need one of your tin buckets. In the summer, he sniffed Heather and sang, I'll see you in my dreams, and watched the monarch butterflies up from Mexico. Spring and fall were his most prosperous times. Fall because the backwoods people stocked up for the winter. He piled goods from the cart onto blazing maple leaves. Spring because they had been out of supplies often for weeks before the roads were passable for his first rounds. Then they came to the wagon like sleepwalkers, bright-eyed and ravenous. Sometimes he came out of the woods with orders for coffins, a child, a wife, wrapped up in burlap and stiff in the woodshed. He tinkered, tin pots, wrought iron, solder melted and cupped in a clay dam, quicksilver patchwork. Occasionally, a pot hammered back flat, the tinkle of tin sibilant, tiny, beneath the lid of the boreal forest. Tinker bird, coppersmith, but mostly a brush and mop drummer. Tinker, tin, tin tinabulation. There was the ring of pots and buckets. There was also the ring in Howard Crosby's ears, a ring that began at a distance and came closer until it sat in his ears and then burrowed into them. His head thrummed as if it were a clapper in a bell. Cold hopped onto the tips of his toes and rode on the ripples of the ringing throughout his body until his teeth clattered and his knees faltered and he had to hug himself to keep from unraveling. This was his aura, a cold halo of chemical electricity that encircled him immediately before he was struck by a full seizure. Howard had epilepsy. His wife, Kathleen, formerly Kathleen Black, of the Quebec blacks, but from a reduced and stern branch of the family, cleared aside chairs and tables and led him to the middle of the kitchen floor. She wrapped a stick of pine in a napkin for him to bite so he would not swallow or chew off his tongue. It, you can't actually bite your tongue off, but that was a common misconception. If the fit came fast, she crammed the bare stick between his teeth and he would wake to a mouthful of splintered wood and the taste of sap. 
his head feeling like a glass jar full of old keys and rusty screws. The stubbornness of some of the country women with whom Howard came into contact on his daily rounds cultivated in him, he believed, or would have believed had he ever consciously thought about the matter, an unshakable reasoning patience. When the, soap opera comp when the soap company discontinued its old detergent for a new formula and changed the design on the box the soap came in, Howard had to endure debates he would have quickly conceded were his adversaries not paying customers. Where's the soap? This is the soap. The box is different. Yes, they changed it. What was wrong with the old box? Nothing. Why'd they change it? Because the soap is better. The soap is different, better. Nothing wrong with the old soap. Of course not, but this is better. Nothing wrong with the old soap. How can it be better? Well, it cleans better. Cleaned fine before. This cleans better and faster. Well, I'll just take a box of the normal soap. <laughs> this is the normal soap now. I can't get my normal soap. This is the normal soap. I guarantee it. Well, I don't like to try a new soap. It's not new. Just as you say, Mr. Crosby, just as you say. Well, ma'am, I need another penny. Another penny for what? The soap is a penny more now that it's better. <laughs> I have to pay a penny more for different soap in a blue box? I'll just take a box of my normal soap. Besides fixing pots and selling soap, these are some of the things that Howard did at one time or another on his rounds sometimes to earn extra money, mostly not. Shoot a rabid dog, deliver a baby, put out a fire, pull a rotten tooth, cut a man's hair, sell five gallons of homemade whiskey for a backwoods bootlegger named Potts, fish a drowned child from a creek. The drowned child was the daughter of a widow named LaRose. She had been playing at the edge of the creek and slipped on a wet stone and split her head and passed out face down in the water. The current had tugged her father into the water, carried her for several hundred feet, and then deposited her on a sandbar in the middle of the creek. Howard took his shoes off and rolled up his trouser legs and waded out to the child. When he first bent to lift her, he did so as if to hoist an errant lamb onto his hip. But when he put his arms under the little body and felt its cold and saw its hair trailing in the current and thought of the child's mother standing behind him on the bank, he turned her face up and raised her and carried her as if she were asleep, and he taking her from the back of a wagon to her pallet bed near the wood stove after returning from a trip visiting relatives. The man whose hair he cut was named Mellish. He was 19 years old and due to be married in an hour and a half. His mother was dead, his sisters and brothers, all much older than he, were married off already and gone to Canada or New Hampshire or south to Woonsocket. His father was plowing their 15 acres of potatoes and would have just as soon scalped the boy as cut his hair because him getting married meant the last helping hands were abandoning the farm. Howard took a pair of shears and a medium-sized tin pot from his wagon. He fitted the pot over the boy's head and cut in a circle around its circumference. When he was done, he took a hand mirror from its wrapping paper and gave it to the boy. The boy turned his head left and then right and handed the mirror back to Howard. He said, I guess that looks pretty smart, Mr. Crosby. The man whose tooth he pulled was named Gilbert. Gilbert was a hermit who lived deep in the woods along the Penobscot River. He seemed not to live in any shelter other than the woods themselves, although some men who hunted in the woods for deer and bear and moose speculated that he might live in some forgotten trapper's cabin. Others thought he might live in a treehouse of some sort, or at least a lean-to. In all the years he was known to live in the forest, never had a winter hunting party seen so much as the ashes from a fire or a single footprint. No one could imagine how a man could survive one winter alone and exposed in the woods, never mind decades of them. Howard, instead of trying to explain the hermit's existence in terms of hearth fires and trapper's shacks, preferred the blank space the old man actually seemed to inhabit. He liked to think of some fold in the woods, some seam that only the hermit could sense and slip into, where the frozen forest itself would accept him and he would no longer need fire or wool blankets, but instead flourish wreathed in snow, spun in frost, 
with limbs like cold wood and blood like frigid sap. Gilbert was a graduate of Bowdoin College. According to the stories, he had liked to boast that he had been a classmate of Nathaniel Hawthorne's. Although he would have to be nearly 120 years old for the rumor to be true, no one cared to refute the claim because they found too delightful to dispel the notion that the local hermit dressed in animal skins, muttering litanies, as often as not in Latin, and in warmer seasons attended by a small but avid swarm of flies, which constantly buzzed around his head, crawled over his nose, and sipped the tears from the corners of his eyes, had once been a clean-faced, well-ironed acquaintance of the author of The Scarlet Letter. Gilbert was apparently not his real name, and no one really knew when he had been born, so the people left it at that. People like to speculate and tell stories about Gilbert the Hermit, especially when they sat around their wood stoves on winter nights with a blizzard howling outside. The thought of him out there in the maelstrom gave them a comforting thrill. Howard supplied Gilbert. Gilbert's needs from the world of men were few, but he did require needles and thread, twine and tobacco. Once a year on the first day that the ice went out of the ponds, sometime in May, Howard rode his wagon to the Camp Comfort Club hunting cabin, itself remote, and from there, toted on his back the supplies he knew Gilbert required down an old Indian trail that followed the river. Somewhere along the way, Howard would meet Gilbert. The men would greet one another with nods of their heads. They struggled down through the, bu through the bushes down to the river's edge, Howard with his bundle, Gilbert with his quart of flies and a buckskin bag. There they would each find a rock or a dry tuft of grass to sit on. Howard took a tin of tobacco from the bundle of supplies he had brought for Gilbert and handed it to the hermit. Gilbert held the open tin to his nose and inhaled slowly, savoring the rich, sweet, near dampness of the new tobacco. By the time he met Howard each year, he was down to the last flakes of his supply. Howard imagined that the fragrance of new tobacco was a sort of confirmation to Gilbert that he had indeed lived another year, endured another winter in the woods. After smelling the tobacco and looking out at the river for a moment, Gilbert held out his hand to Howard. Howard took a pipe from one of his jacket pockets and gave it to the hermit. Howard did not otherwise smoke and kept the pipe for this one bowl full a year. Gilbert packed Howard's pipe and then his own, which was beautiful, carved from a burl of dark red wood and which Howard imagined belonging once, long ago, in a brass stand on a dean's desk. And the two men smoked together in silence and watched the waters rush. While he smoked, Gilbert's flock of flies temporarily dispersed, but seemingly without rancor or resentment. When the pipes were spent, each man tapped the ashes out against his rock and put his pipe away. The flies settled back in their orbit around the her hermit's head Circum Caput, he muttered, and he opened his buckskin bag and produced two crude wooden carvings, one which seemed to be a moose, the other a beaver, or perhaps a woodchuck, or even a groundhog. The work was so poor that Howard could only say for sure that the little raw wooden lumps that the hermit placed in the winter dead grass between them were supposed to be animals of some kind. Next to the carvings, Gilbert then lay a beautifully skinned fox fur, head included, that smelled like rotting meat. There was a moment of panic for the flies as they decided which was more rancid, the hermit or the skin. In the end, they were loyal to their more pungent living host. Howard placed the bundle of supplies on the grass and each man collected his goods. The men had exchanged few words during the first years of this spring ritual and these only to refine the order of Gilbert's supplies. One year he said, more needles. Another year he said, no more tea, coffee now. Once the list had been refined and finally established, the men no longer spoke at all. For the past seven years, neither man had uttered a single word to the other. The last year Howard met Gilbert in the woods, though, the men spoke. When he came upon the hermit, he saw that the hermit's cheek was as swollen and as shiny as a ripe apple. Gilbert shuffled his feet and stared at the ground and held his hand against the cheek. Even the flies were solicitous of their sponsor's pain and seemed to buzz more gingerly about him. Howard cocked his head in a silent question. Gilbert whispered, tooth. 
Howard could not imagine that this old husk of a man, this recluse who seemed not much more than a sour hank of hair and rags, had a tooth left in his head to ache. Nevertheless, it was true. Stepping closer, Gilbert opened his mouth and Howard, squinting to get a good look, saw in that dank, ruined, purple cavern, stuck way in the back of an otherwise empty levee of gums, a single black tooth planted in a swollen and bright red throne of flesh. A breeze caught the hermit's breath and Howard gasped and saw visions of slaughterhouses and dead pets under porches. Tooth, the hermit said again and pointed into his mouth. Oh yes, an awful thing, Howard said and smiled in sympathy. The hermit said, no, tooth, and continued pointing. Howard realized that the poor afflicted man wanted him to take the tooth out. Oh, no, no, he said, I have no idea. Gilbert cut him off. No, tooth, he squeaked an octave higher than before. But I haven't any... Again, the hermit cut him off, shooing him back to where his wagon stood three miles away at the Comfort Camp Club cabin. Howard returned two and a half hours later with a small flask of corn whiskey from Potts Mountainside Still and a pair of long-handled pliers he used when he had to solder small pieces of tin to leaky pots. At first, Gilbert refused any liquor, but when Howard grabbed the tooth with the pliers, the old man passed out. Howard dashed a handful of cold river water on Gilbert's face. The hermit came to and motioned for the whiskey, which he drank in a single draft, then passed out again from the alcohol on the bedeviled tooth. Another splash of water revived Gilbert, and the two men sat for a time watching a pair of sparrows chase a crow above the fir trees on the other side of the river. The river was high after an early fast melt and loud. Voices seemed to mingle in the water as if there were a race of men who dwelled among the rapids. When Gilbert began to list and recite Virgil, Howard reached into the hermit's mouth with the pliers, grabbed the fetid tooth, and pulled with all of his strength. The tooth did not budge. Howard let go. Gilbert looked baffled for a moment and then passed out again, flat on his back, the flies neatly following him from upright to laid out. Howard was convinced at first that his customer was dead, but a damp whistle from the hermit's fly-rimmed nose indicated that he could still be counted among the relatively quick. The old man's mouth hung wide open. Howard straddled his shoulders and grabbed the tooth with the pliers. When he finally succeeded in excavating the tooth, Gilbert's face and beard were covered in blood. Another splash of river water revived the patient. When he saw Howard standing before him with the gory pliers in one hand and a tooth extraordinarily long of root in the other, Gilbert fainted. Two weeks later, Buddy the dog's barking wakened Howard. He rose from bed and went to the kitchen door to see if there was a bear or stray cow in the yard. Placed on the doorstep was a package wrapped in greasy, foul-smelling leather and tied with twine, which Howard recognized as the type he sold. Standing in the moonlight, he untied the twine and unfolded the leather. Be beneath the leather was a layer of red velvet. Howard opened the velvet and there, looking as new as the day it was printed, the pages uncut, was a copy of the Scarlet Letter. Howard opened the book. Inscribed on the title page were the words, To Hick Gilbert. Here is to the shared memories of young men in the prime of their journeys. Yours always in faith and brotherly friendship, Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1852. When the ice went out the next year, Howard took his pipe from its drawer in the wagon and rubbed it across the thigh of his pants and blew into the bowl and put it in his jacket pocket. He made up a bundle of Gilbert's supplies and hiked along the Indian trail. There was no sign of the hermit. Howard made the hike every day for a week, but Gilbert never appeared. On the seventh day, Howard turned off the trail and sat by the river and smoked a pipe full of the tobacco that he had packed for the hermit. As he smoked, he listened to the voices in the rapids. They murmured about a place somewhere deep in the woods where a set of bones lay on a bed of moss, above which a troop of mournful flies had kept vigil the previous autumn until the frosts came and they too had succumbed. Thank you.
thank you kindly. So I'd be happy to um, answer questions or discuss current events or anything you <laughs> want. If you would. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. So the question is, um, uh, who may or may have been or was the inspiration for Howard, the tinker? Um, and I, I can, um, the, the dramatic, the basic dramatic premises for the novel are all based on stories that my own grandfather told me about his life growing up in northern Maine. Um, and so um, you could sort of fit all of them on half of a three by five index card. But my great grandfather um, would be who Howard is. Um, he wasn't a tinker, he was a fuller brush salesman. But he was itinerant and he was kind of a peddler. Um, and he, as in the book, if you take a look at the book, um, he uh, abandoned my grand, left my grandfather's family when my grandfather was 12 um, because he had epilepsy and his wife was going to have him um, committed to an asylum. Um, and so that is, all, that is true, that, that is factual. Um, there's another character in the book named George Crosby who's a repairer of antique clocks and the, the story is sort of framed around a sort of vigil that his family is keeping on his deathbed. Um, and that, that's my grandfather repaired and traded antique clocks and I, I, I apprenticed with him. So there's all this business in the book about clocks. So that's, um, but beyond that, um, my, my grandfather um, would never elaborate on the stories about his life in northern Maine. And I, I've come to think that it's a, from a, 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 a a, a combination of personal grief at how difficult his life was. It was very impoverished, it was very traumatic, very chaotic, and a kind of generational tact that he and my grandmother both had. They both, they, they both were of the mind that, uh, you know, the past is the past. We're all lucky to have each other and to be prospering now. And so the past, we leave the past in the past, which of course made the material all the more irresistible to me. You know, those are my begats. I, you know. um, and so when he passed away, I just lost access to the, to the documentary sources for that. And so I just took those basic dramatic linchpins, which are maybe a sentence apiece, and just started to write imagined versions of them and, and, and just sort of spiraled out until the fictional or the imagined version of, of the stories um, achieved their own integrity. Their own, their own logic and their own integrity. Yep. Uh, my question is in one way related to what you just had. As you know, authors sometimes have their work just flow out. Other times there's revision, revision, revision. Sometimes there's interviews, sometimes there's research. Can you take us on a little bit of a journey uh, of your, that has to do with your process? Sure, the, the, the question is just to, uh, uh, just to um, talk a little bit about the process of writing, um, of writing the book and my process. One thing that's interesting is I'm working on a second novel. This is just my first book. So one of the things that's, that's interesting to observe over the course of writing the second novel is what was just ineptitude the first time around and what is actually how I, how I write when I can do it well. Um, <laughs> and um, so I mean, I think that there's a real ebb and flow to the writing of a novel. I, I write in a very, very, um, I, 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 I think it's almost, the most accurate way to describe it is a, a, like collaging, or even like um, moving the tiles in a mosaic around to try to find the best portray, to model the, the subjects as best as possible. I did no research for this book. Um, Partly because I had worked initially on a first novel, another novel for three years that was about a 12-year-old girl who disguises herself as a boy in order to work in a silver mine in 16th century me colonial Mexico. <laughs> so I, I, I got to the point where I couldn't write a single sentence without doing a week's worth of research. You know, would the German mining engineer have a buckle on his shoes? You know, and I, I just, I couldn't get the thing up past costume drama. Um, and so this was actually, you know, by returning to this, you know, I'm familiar with the landscape of northern Maine. I spent most of my childhood knocking around Audubon sanctuaries up on the North Shore. Um, and so I'm just prone to birch bark metaphysics is what I call it. Um, and, and, and so I was just able to sort of, um, you know, have the tone of voice, the landscape, the qualities of life right at my fingertips as the, as the characters sort of arrived on the page. So that, so that, went, so that um, with all of that right at my fingertips, I was able to concentrate on, on what is most interests me when I'm writing fiction, which is character. Um, and, and so when, I'm, when I write, I, I write the sort of 
Oppos the opposition I always think of in my head, this is not normative, but just for the way when I think of it, is there's a difference between declarative writing and interrogative writing. And I write interrogatively, which is I write in order to find out what's actually going on. I write to discover who is it that I see in this kind of you know, snapshot or in a kind of tapestry or painting. And, and so I just parse out moments. Um, when fiction comes to me, um, I mean, a, lot of, a lot of what writing is is you have to take what the defense gives you. And so when I, I, um, I don't think in terms of plot, plot is a predicate of character to me. It emerges out of, as a result of character. And when fiction comes to me, fictional moments come to me, they come to me in instants, just single moments, which I then sort of, um, I, I think of, I, I, there's, a, there's a term in mechanical drawing called an exploded view. You know, when you like buy a lawnmower and you look at, the, there's, a, there's a drawing of the lawnmower and it's like every piece of the lawnmower from every screw. You know? um, and so I think of like, I get a moment and I just parse it out. I just, I, I do exploded versions of it. And just, you know, I, I, I just kind of, dis, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process of revelation and discovery. Um, Wallace Stevens said that, you know, philosophers conduct all their probings deliberately and poets conduct their probings fortuitously. And so that's how, I mean, my process is very slapdash. I go all around, you know. Um, another met lawnmower metaphor is that I'm like one of those robot met um, lawnmowers. I just like bang around the yard and eventually I get the whole thing mowed. <laughs> you know, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so these are the, oh, so so first of all, I have to use the term like I was a I was a musician. I use the term very lightly. Um, I was a drummer in a rock band for years, and I could tell you, I you know encyclopedias of dumb drummer jokes. You know what do you call the guy that follows the band around from town to town? That sort of thing. Um, so um, so but yeah, I mean I, I think of. Um, I think that the differences between, say, drumming and writing are actually superficial. Uh, you know, the one is very social, um, it's, it's loud, it's obnoxious, according to some people. Um, it made me, I'm clinically half deaf, I have tinnitus, I hear ringing in my ears all the time. Um, and, you know, the other one is quiet and solitary and all that. But, um, but the main way I think of my, I think of art, you know, the way that you conduct art, is I think of myself as an amanuensis. I'm just sort of taking dictation from the great, you know, out, you know, cosmos or whatever. And so to me, it's all, it's incidental whether I have a pair of drumsticks in my hands or I'm at a keyboard when the stuff comes through. And if it comes through and I have drums, drumsticks, I just start playing what I, th you know. And if and and if I'm at the keyboard, I precipitate it into language rather than rhythm. Um, but that said, I write by ear. I write by rhythm. I think very musically. Um, if you take a look at the book, the book is, it's, it's, not, it's not linear at all. It's very associative. Um, it works by rhythm. It works by, um, by harmony and overtone and juxtaposition and all that sort of stuff. So I'm kind of an ersatz composer. I think of it as, 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 as sort of what kind of overtones and undertones and harmonics can I get when I move. When I, you know, when I move different pieces around and all that. So I think of it as arrangement and I think about counterpoint and all that, and all that sort of stuff. So, and that's of a piece with writing interrogatively or intuitively or fortuitously, which is sometimes I get the rhythm of the prose before I get what the actual sentence means. Um, I also think of the, I also think of the, um, I mean, the sort of maybe the linchpin between the prose and the music is that I think of the writing in Tinkers as unlineated poetry. So it's very lyric. You know, I, I think of it as I think of it in musical terms. So. Yeah. Um, I have a comment. I hope it's not too obtuse. Um, I, I'd like your response to it. And that is, uh, it seems to me another major character in the novel is nature itself, mm -hmm. and that there are two different perspectives mm -hmm. or takes on nature. Yeah. And one is perhaps Howard's take with nature as other, as this stranger. And then the narrator's portrayal of nature, which is as a manifestation or a figure for consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had anything to say about that. Yeah, so the, 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 the question is about, um, is about uh, nature as, or the landscape as a character almost in the story, and how um, the different characters sort of interact with that. Um, one of my absolute all-time favorite writers is Wallace Stevens. Um, 
and when you read his poems, you know, they're often about the weather, or the, you know, more particularly about the weather, generally about landscape. Um, and, and the ideal that I try to keep in mind from him, that I take from him, is that, I mean, I'm very, again, I'm very pastoral. I just, I mean, I, I've spent all my time sort of twiddling with grass and birch bark out in the, you know, in the, next to the creek in the, in the Audubon. Um, and so it's, you know, miniaturist sort of thing. But um, I never write about landscape just for the sake of describing landscape. Landscape, every description of landscape is always a refraction of character. You know, it's a, it, it is a function of, of, of perception. Um, so that when you put these characters in the landscapes, it's always, you know, whatever angle of refraction is, it's always illuminating, um, it's always illuminating character. Um, and then, then within the book, there are different, you know, there's, the, there's a kind of more kind of enlightenment deterministic kind of um, Newtonian um, cause and effect sort of ideal, um, which the, the clockmaker has and, and wishes for the world. And I, I think of that just emotionally, which is he came from such a chaotic, disrupted childhood that the idea of an orderly universe is very, very powerful for him. Very, he's very much attracted to it. Um, and then the other, his father, Howard, um, is much more prone to just sort of drifting off and kind of almost becoming coextensive with whatever landscape that, that, that he's a part of. It's almost quantum, I almost think of it as. Um, and so, and, and the lovely thing about being um, a writer of fiction is I don't have to um, make an argument for either one of those models of existence. I can just write, I'm, 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 I'm not advocating and I'm not explaining, I'm describing things experientially and very subjectively. So my job is just to make beautiful versions, beautiful instances of both versions and put them next to each other and watch how they synthesize and precipitate third, you know, third, fourth, fifth things off of that. So it's just a kind of, there's a generative principle about, you know, sort of opposing those different, those different views. Yeah? Mm -hmm. it's when there's that very brief reunion right. between Howard and George. Yeah, um, so the question is just to, to comment on, there's a, there's a scene in the, in the book where, um, uh, you know, mo most of the book consists of George Crosby trying to reassemble a, 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 a coherent memory of his father, Howard. Um, and it's almost a, an act of, um, it's, it's, an, it's an attempt at reconciliation with his father before he, pa before he George, passes away. Um, and at the end, there's a, there's a, there's a note of a, a, there's a brief um, reunion. Many, many years later, Howard comes to um, George's house on Christmas Day and visits him for 10 minutes. Um, one of the interesting things about that, you know, between t thinking about fact and fiction, you know, what, is that I no longer can remember if my grandfather told me that his father came back years later and visited him once or if I just made it up. And my mother doesn't remember, my aunts don't remember, any of those sorts of things. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, to me, um, since that is his goal through the whole book, and since the whole book is actually sort of structured, um, staged as basically a countdown to George's death, you know, I, I always knew from the very beginning that the very last word of the book would be, would be, um, would be um, coincidental with the, inst the moment of his, the end of his worldly career. Um, and so there just seemed to be a dramatic logic to that, 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 that he's trying to have a reunion with his father, and in the end, he, what, th that reunion takes, the place, t t um, takes place in the form of a recollection of an actual reunion. Um, and it's very brief and it's very modest, which is consistent with just the lives and the, you know, the milieu of the book. Um, and I, but I wanted to give them the satisfaction of sort of standing face to face just for a moment at the end of the book. So the, the question is just about what other stuff I wrote before Tinkers. Um, I wrote a f few short stories, only published two of them. Um, I started off trying to write poetry and I could never figure out where to put the damn line breaks. You know, so I just, I just said, forget it, I'll just write until you know, it returns. And so I, you know, I just actually just sort of thought, but I sat and I can, t I can you know, tell you sob stories about sitting in fiction workshops. You know, people saying, this is not realistic at all. This isn't realism. This is not psychological, and he said, yes, that's right, it's not. Um, uh, 
so yeah, there was that, you know, and, you know the, the sort of famous anecdote that Faulkner has about, you know, I started off, you know, poetry is the greatest form of writing. I started off trying to be a poet and I wasn't any good, so I went to the next best thing, which is short story writing. And then when I couldn't do that, I became a novelist, which is sort of how I feel, you know. It's just sort of, and, you know, and then along the lines of, you know, J Henry James calling the novel a loose, baggy monster. I like that kind of, that capaciousness, that sort of, you know, it's just like silt bi building up in the ri river, the cumulative effects that you can get from a novel of just spending time with characters. Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, that, that's basically, I've written a few short stories, I threw that other novel away. I might go picking through that someday to see if I can get some scraps from it. But um, Tinker's, the novel is, ba it, um, it was, the first version of it was, a sh was the second short story I tried to write. So it was just one of those things where I found a subject and it just stuck with me and I stuck with it and just, just pursued it. Did you have something? I just want to make sure. Question is, where will I be in 15 years? I don't. Yeah, no, I know I'll be in South Carolina. No, I, no, no, I know, I know. Yeah, I had to say. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you're a writer. That's one of the reasons why you're an artist, or any, you know, which is just, it'll be. It, it's it's always interesting to see it as it kind of emerges. You know, as what your intentions for your own future arrive at. You know, when the as, as the present moment arrives. Um, I don't know. I mean, right now I'm, I, you know, I, I'm working on a second novel, which is about one of George Crosby's grandsons, um, and it's not a sequel per se, but it takes place in the same same town, subsequent to the action in Tinker's, and um, and I don't know. This is a kind of a chicken or the egg thing, but I'm contracted with Random House for the second book and a third book, um, and since I have no idea what the third book is going to be, I'm just thinking trilogy, you know. But that might just be because you know, sort of, it's a placeholder for the. Um, and so that'll take me f through the next five or seven years. Um, and then I, you know, I, I'm imagining that I'll want to take time off and sort of just see, see what comes up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that, you know, that the, the sort of idea that o over, over the course of time you see the larger arc of your own preoccupations and the shit. But that, to me that's always retrospective. It's sort of, it's tough for me to see it, what it actually is when, I, when, I, when I'm doing it. Um, and whenever I start thinking that I can connect the dots, I try to write something that I feel like I don't know how to write. You know, because you know, I don't want to, it's, it's just that, you know, that fear of being rote, of just reconfirming to yourself over and over again what you think you already know about the world. In between, I, I, I taught full-time um, Harvard's version of freshman comp expository writing. Um, I taught that full-time and then taught um, at the Harvard Extension School at night and was raising two sons under five years old at the time. So in my spare time, I worked on Tinkers. Um, and uh, um, I, I was just, I mean, for the longest time, I was just piling prose up. I was just getting writing on the, you know, just getting, you know, writing on the page. And then one of my um, former teachers with, uh, at, at Iowa, um, with whom I kept in touch after Iowa, a wonderful English novelist named Barry Unsworth, um, uh, finally said to me, Paul, I should like to see this novel with which you keep threatening me. You know, and, I, and so I, 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 I printed the thing up, found that it was, it was sort of not, it, it, it had no shape, it had no form to it. So I printed the manuscript up and actually took a, had a pair of scissors and scotch tape and staples and cut the whole thing up and fanned it out over my living room floor and then assembled it into the, roughly the, pre the form that it's in right now. And I thought, well, isn't this a pleasant surprise? I have a novel on my hands. <laughs> so, some would disagree still to this day, but you know, all, all's fair. Um, uh, and um, so I thought, oh, this is great. And so I, 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 um, I, I sent it out to editors and to agents and, um, and just met with unanimous rejection, some of it perfectly polite and some of it perfectly obnoxious. Um, and, um, and, you know, that was personally very frustrating because, um, because I thought, well, gee, somebody's got to publish this thing, right? There's got, there's got to be people out there who would be interested in this. Um, but it proved not to be the case, you know. Um, objectively, I wasn't, too, I wasn't too upset about it because I, that's the common lot of artists and, you know, actors and writers and dancers. You know, it's just tough to get a gig. It's just tough to, it's just, T tough to get your work out there. 
Um, so I put it in a drawer and just went on to the next thing. I was very busy with raising kids and, and, and um, teaching. Um, so it sat in the drawer for three and a half or four years. And then, and then it was just published by accident. Years later, I was um, crying in my beer with a poet. They're very good to cry in your beer with. Um, about the about the state, you know, the, the difficult state of publishing, um, and uh, and he said, well, look, I have a friend who runs a small independent press in New York City. Why don't you query him? You can use my name. Um, and so I said, great, I'd love to. Uh, I'll do that. I did. The guy was very gracious. He read the novel, said, I like this novel very much, and I'm not going to publish it. And I thought, here we go again. But he said, he said, but tomorrow night I'm actually having dinner with a woman named Erica Goldman, who is the editor of a new not-for-profit press that is um, being run by the NYU School of Medicine. And do you mind if I pass the manuscript along to her? And I said, of course not. Um, and 10 days later, she called me and said she wanted to do the, wanted to do the book, um, which was great. I mean, because as soon as there were 50 copies of the book in between two covers, to me, it was all gravy from there. I mean, I just figured, it was, you know, I could put it with the CDs from the band I was in and say, Daddy wrote a book, too. You know, like, whatever. Um, and um, uh, and so we were, and, you know, and Bellevue, is, it's Bellevue is the infamous Bellevue Hospital, and the 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 press is is located in a glorified janitor's closet, basically. It's slightly more glorified now, they tell me. But um, so so the book the book came out and it had kind of no publicity, no there's no budget marketing budget, you know, behind it, but. Um, it started to get good reviews right from the beginning and, and just kind of kept puttering along. And I, um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time doing, which I, I can't do now, but whenever I did readings at bookstores and people came up to me afterwards and said, oh, I, you know, I, enjoyed, I enjoy, enjoyed the event or enjoyed the book, um, I'm going to get my readers group, my book club, to read the book. I said, great, if you do that, I will come to your house and I will talk, to the book, uh, talk with you about the book when you, when you do it. So I ate a lot of casseroles and drank a lot of Chardonnay. <laughs> I went to people's houses, and that's just kind of how I did it, just, just sort of like kind of grassroots. And, it, 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 and between doing that and just it being hand-sold um, uh, at, at independent bookstores, it just, it just kind of had a life of its own, you know, took on a life of its own. And then, um, and then lo and behold, it, it won the Pulitzer, which is about as abruptly as it happened for me, which is um, when you win the Pulitzer, they don't tell you ahead of time that you've won. They just post the winners on their website. And so I was teaching in Iowa, and I, you know, I knew when they were going to post the winners because, you know, it's my, that's my gig. You know, that's my, that's, you know, that's my, that's, you know, I figured, oh, I'll check in and see who won the Pulitzer this year. And when I, I brought up the web page and it said, Tinker's Paul Harding, and I thought, I'm not looking for Tinker's Paul Harding, I'm looking for the Pulitzer. And so, you know, I refreshed it and I was like, you know, what's going on with this damn computer? And then, and then it sort of, and then it sort of just hit me that this, in fact, was the case, and that it wasn't my friends playing a joke on me or something like that. And it, it really was one of those times, and I mean, it was the only time in my life where I sort of had like a waking blackout. Like I, I actually, the sort of the facts outstripped my ability to believe in them, you know. And and so I just, I mean, I was just, I was just, just flabbergasted, just stunned. Um, sort of slipped off the couch onto the floor, and you know, a minute later, the AP, the Associated Press, was on the phone asking for a quote, you know, which is something like, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's just, in, in some ways, I'm, I mean, I'm accustomed, I'm habituated to it now, but I still don't really quite believe it. There's something sort of detached about it all that's sort of, um, and, and having, and, and winning it for your first book puts you in a position of realizing that at least the rest of my life or my career as a writer is going to be dedicated to, um, uh, you know, the, the Pulitzer will be that to, to which I attempt to be equal for the rest of my career as a writer, you know. So, okay. that's it. That's, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.